Bobbish. Please welcome Julia Longton to the next talk in our session. Um, she is uh, enthusiastic about 3D printing and does all that with Pesco. So let's see what that's about. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, before we begin, if you want to follow along these slides, you can't see them for any particular reason. The source of this uh, is all on the bottom of the screen here. So I'm Julia Longton. I'm a free software developer. I've been developing free software for roughly 20 years, from everything from the kernel up. I work at Wire.com, but this has nothing to do with my workplace. We're an encrypted messaging company, nothing to do with 3D printing. Um, I maintain ImplicitCAD, and I'm actually the author of a, a slicer as well, 8Slice. I say maintain ImplicitCAD because I'm still I'm an operations engineer by trade, so I'm sort of exposing the functionality that's there. I'm not quite, the, the math of some of this is still a bit above me. So I've run two different hackerspaces for roughly eight years combined back in the States. So one in Washington, D.C. and one in the middle of the United States in Fayetteville, Arkansas. So I started maintaining implicit cad after i after i took over hack dc so i have experimented on all of the people who would stand still for five minutes and talk about 3d printing there i'm a transhumanist i would prefer to be 3d printing people instead of plastic but right now the printers i have at home are just of the plastic variety i've been building some strange printers for roughly 10 years now, uh, Free Geek Arkansas was kind of half computer recyclery, so I ended up with all kinds of weird pieces and just implemented them in the machines that I built. I also have invented a method for 3D printing parts and then turning them into aluminum, but that is a different talk. <laughs> so Implicit Cat is a programmatic 3D modeler. This means that you write a piece of software you run it through the compiler, you get a thing at the output of it. It was written by Christopher Ola back in 2011, but he has left the project to get involved in some San Francisco artificial intelligence startup thing quite a long time ago. So it's licensed under the AGPL v3, in part because at the bottom here I have a link to the uh, online editor and I want to make sure that somebody else doesn't set up another online editor, write a better version, and then not give it to the community in general. Implicit Cat is written in Haskell, which, well, it, it's interesting from the perspective of finding other developers. Implicit Cat basically breaks down into three pieces. You've got a rendering engine, you've got an execution engine for a language called SCAD, has anybody here 3D printed objects before? Show of hands. Okay, anybody who should raise their hand design any of their objects? Okay. So SCAD is probably one of the things you were using to do that. The, I, I use the generic term SCAD here because, because there are multiple engines that are kind of implementing the same language. It's not really the same language. It's sort of like you would consider C and C++. They're C-ish, but and there's Objective-C. There, there's kind of this family. And if you squint at the code just right, then you can believe that code written for one of them is written for the other of them. But in practice, they're a little bit different. This is all wrapped up in a Haskell library, so you can pull out the SCAD engine, you can do modeling, you can all the above with Implicit Cat. Uh, Implicit Cat's engine is based on a uh, it's based on a modified version of a marching squares algorithm. So we scan an area, and for all the points, all the points here on the left that are red are where it intersects with an object in this case. And we end up drawing a series, of, a series of points kind of at the halfway point whenever there's a difference between where you're at and the space that you can see contains no object, and then sort of just drawing a harder line around it. 
this is a, uh, well, it's a lossy method of doing things, but it's very easy to parallelize. Um, yeah, we have got it. This is all written in Haskell, so parallelization was pretty easy. I just use a giant list comprehension, and so it will abuse all the CPUs you have. It can put things out in two dimensions, three dimensions. If it's 3D, then it's basically one of the formats that is effectively triangles on the outside surface of your object. That is how most 3D modeling is done, or at least most uh, most STLs or object files, or you know, you end up with triangles on the outside. So it's really hard to go from triangles on the outside back to your original object, which is a problem that we have in the community. So like I said, implicit CAD's a SCAD engine. It's open SCAD like It's not actually open SCAD. This on the left is open SCAD. That on the right is the implicit CAD website. It's the same code. If you're, if you're working with basic SCAD functions in both languages, they're exactly identical. The Haskell library, like I said, produces a, can be used as a DSL. The SCAD execution engine can be pulled out, and it's not too fun on its own. But one thing that I have found interesting is that the expression handling of the language is actually in a separate monad and is its own uh, is its own pure implementation. So I don't have I can use it in outside programs instead of having a key value. I have a key expression system. The executables that come with implicit CAD there are two of them. One of them runs the website itself, which you can see here at the bottom of the screen. And the other one of them is a command line utility, which I end up using essentially like a C compiler. It even takes some of the same arguments. You've got your dash capital D for defining a variable so that you can pass it in from the command line into the object that you're rendering so that you don't have to go editing, you know, editing parameters that you're using. There are at least four other SCAD engines I'm going to talk about here. Um, one of them is OpenSCAD, as you can tell from the fact that I've probably mentioned it 10 times now. It is the big one in this field. It's, it's graphical, and honestly, I don't like that. I'm not a very big graphical tool person, so that's why ImplicitCAD is more of, a, more of a command line utility. I'm trying to build an object C compiler, for lack of a better word of putting it. Um, OpenSCAD and OpenJSCAD, if you squint just right, you can ignore the fact that each one of them is a different thing, and you can ignore the fact that they're not implicit CAD. The languages are very, very close together. Think more like shell scripting languages than anything else. There's two more that are a bit on the interesting side. Um, so Curve3D actually took a look at the math behind implicit CAD, which we're going to get into in a bit. And they rewrote it in C++. It runs all on a GPU, so it's got all those wonderful dependencies of having a very fast GPU in your system. But it uses a language that is not so scattish. So Curve3D, uh, Curve, and CAD Query you really can't translate programs that are written into them into each other very simply or translate them back into a SCAD like the other ones. CAD query is uh, actually very interesting. I'm trying to stare at its syntax a bit more. They, they have a concept of surfaces that I find interesting. There have been at least three other implementations of, well, literally somebody taking the, the implicit CAD source code and pulling it apart and writing themselves a new, a new Python program because for them Haskell is hard. So at least one of them that I know of, they're, they're all non-free, but one of them I have been informed is in use by a military service, which I'm not very comfortable with, but that's the world we live in and that's their software. Technically it's not even mine, so. So why implicit cat? Um, implicit CAD uses the same simple SCAD language that the other SCAD engines are using. So this is, a, this is an object here that we produce by removing a circle from a square after we translate the square 
back down to be on the other side of the circle because the origin of a square is considered to be at the corner. And then we linear extrude it so that it's actually thicker. So this is a 10 millimeter thick object with a nine millimeter hole or with an 18 millimeter hole that is 20 millimeters wide. Implicit CAD's Haskell DSL is, well, pretty simple. This is, uh, this is a 10 by 10, or a 10 millimeter radius cylinder, one millimeter thick. So Implicit CAD has a series of writer functions, which you give them a file name and you tell them at what resolution they should be running the uh, the marching squares algorithm, <coughs> and they will run marching squares against whatever object that you produce there out on the right hand side of the dollar sign. The OpenSCAD execu execution engine, EXE OpenSCAD, dumps an intermediary form, which I've been which I use for debugging on these sort of things, but that intermediary form, it's what happens when you run the SCAD, it will give you the data structure. Basically, I just run show against the thing, and it's reasonably easy to go from that straight into Haskell code. So you don't have to do any of this OpenSCAD stuff, and even if you have somebody else's OpenSCAD, you can just take it right apart and get Haskell out of it. Now, here's where things start getting a little bit interesting. Implicit CAD's model of an object is not based on where the boundary of the object is. So implicit CAD, this is your standard circle on the left, but the one on the right is an implicit circle, which is to say that everything that is colored is a negative value when run through the implicit function, and everything that is black and white is a positive value. Yeah, I abuse list comprehensions. This is the two-dimensional form of putting triangles onto a surface. So if you have a drawing and you want to get it out of implicit CAD, it covers it in triangles. And the three-dimensional version of this would not even think of fitting anywhere near on these pages. So I'm going to go over a little bit of basic CSG to start with, your constructive solid geometry, so that you can recognize the difference when we're looking at using implicit formulas for this stuff. So here's our circle, and here's our square. The interesting thing about the square is, of course, that the corner of it is at the corner of the square, not in the middle. I could tell it a center equals true on that line, and it would actually center the thing, but I tend not to do that because then I forget it and then I screw up my models. So here's translating it back to the center. So use a translate function to do that. There's also a union function for putting two objects together. And at that point, they can be referred to as one object. When you're trying to remove, say, I want just the corner of that circle. So you put a square on the corner and then intersect it with the circle, and you'll get just that pie-shaped piece. And if you, want, if you ask for the difference, then it will occlude the circle with the square, giving you that Pac-Man-shaped piece. This is the same thing over again, because I am a boring and repetitive person, except that this is Haskell. So right SVG of our circle gives us our circle. Right SVG of R, in this case, rect R, the R and that zero are going to be important in a bit, gives us our square. It's a rectangle that's from 0, 0 to 20, 20. The same thing is true with a, with our union function, with our translate function. They're just regular Haskell functions you can abuse. Here's our intersection and our difference. Note that there are still R's and zeros there. This is for rounding functions, which will come in later. There are other primitives that I'm not even 
I'm going to bother going over there. You know, you can have polygons, you can have cubes, you can have spheres. We actually had a model of a, a, a we referred to a cylinder earlier. There are also other operations that you perform to CSG objects, scaling, rotating, or taking a two-dimensional object and extruding it in a direction to give yourself a three-dimensional object. The flow control in a SCAD language, this is true for all of them, is it's effectively trying to be C-ish. So fours, ifs, else. I guess you could also call that a bit bash-ish. The only interesting thing of note is that we have a module instead of module to declare a component that you're going to reuse and that you pass arguments into the same way that we would a function. And there are functions in the language, but they're effectively being treated in all of them the same as modules. The difference between the two is something that is still being worked out in the community. So here's a disk. It shows kind of the, uh, the reusing of modules. So I usually end up writing my code sort of in this fashion where you start, I, I start from the bottom where you've got the call of the function that's above it and the function above that. The important thing is that all the parameters are actually passed in on the function call, and the functions themselves, or the modules themselves, I'm still thinking in C here, the modules themselves have no constants in them except for you know, the primitive stuff that you need, diameter divided by two. This one here is kind of bead. So it is two cylinders, one of which is different from the other cylinder, giving us a hole in the middle of the thing. And again, just from a keeping my code sanitary perspective, I've got the parameters actually in the function call rather than in the object itself. You can just write this raw like we were doing earlier, but I tend to write an object so that they're reusable. OK, so implicit CSG. This is the thing that, like, three or four programs have run off with so far, and nobody has documented. So in implicit CSG, you use a function to describe the object. And in the case of like, in the case of something like a square or a circle, it looks about like a distance from the edge. But as you start unioning and as you start actually operating on these things, that abstraction falls apart but the edge still remains in the same place. So the interior of your object is a negative value, the exterior of your object is positive, and the border between those two, where you actually hit zero, is the edge that we would consider the object. So I'm going to apologize a little bit ahead of time for the way that I write functions, because they're not really mathy, they're not really, yeah, they're functions. <laughs> So on the top, you have our standard circle. But on the bottom, we're using an implicit function, which is to say that you can run this function against any point and know how far on the inside or the outside of the circle you are. But this, is, this implicit function for a circle is only going to hold up while you're you know, working just with circles. If you're looking at it as, as a distance, then it's going to trip you up later. All, the only important part is, whether it's positive, whether it's negative, or whether it's interior, or whether it's the border. So to translate a function, well, to translate any of the functions, we just take our, uh, take our values and deduct them to go up and to the right, which I would normally consider the positive direction. I think whenever I look at it, I think implicit math is backwards, because I'm deducting in order to increase, and I'm dividing in order to multiply, and so implicit math is kind of backwards that way. Here's a scale function where, as I said, in order to get our circle, which is a default unit of one unit, up to a different unit, in this case I uh, ended up with 1.25, I divide it. So you give it a 1.25 for SX and SX, SY, and that's what you get. So here's our implicit function for a square. Um, yeah, sorry about the top one. I'm, my math and my programming gets all mixed up. So when we're uniony objects, we effectively take the objects, the two, 
two formulas on our left, or two functions on our left, are this circle and this square. But if you take those and you move them a little bit, which is what the 0.25s are about, and then you take the minimum of the two of them, you get yourself one formula that is both objects combined. So remember I was saying that if you're looking at it as a distance from edge, you're going to start tripping yourself up? Yeah, those red spots in the middle are definitely not distance from edgy anymore. So when we're taking the intersection of an object, we take the maximum of the two. And that gives us, in this case, this is a, this is a circle that has had a square intersected with it. So we end up with just the portion of the circle that the square was covering, or just the portion of the square that the circle was covering. It's not very much of a difference. So this almost dead looking Pac-Man, because I didn't separate it off by 0.5, I separated it by 0.25, is what happens when we take the maximum of the thing of the thing that's going to be removed from and the inverse of the thing being removed. So you can use this on multiple objects at once by just having more things in the maximum as long as the other objects are all being removed. <laughs> now this is the thing that uh, this is the thing that most just edge modelers have a problem <coughs> So if you're trying to round a space in between two objects, that's what the equation ends up looking like here. And that gives us a circle where the space between the circle and the square kind of end up melting together, which structurally is, uh, is very useful. One of the nice things about ImplicitCAD's CSG is that it's very easy to get things that are round. Doing a round box like this in a standard model means you have to take away the portion of the edge that is a difference of the circle of the, of the edge of the square. Of the, it, it gets ugly, and in this case, I get to just get away with specifying a roundness on the edges because I have an R minimum function and the rounding actually ends up working to my advantage here. Uh, one thing that messes with me a little bit is if you take a square and you round it by half the square, you have a circle. And you can pick any point in between circle and square and just provide a value and it will just work, which is really hard to do with, uh, with other modeling systems. Now, most of the primitives in implicit CAD support rounding. So, like I said earlier, with all those rect R's and all those translate R's and union R's, at any of those points, you, you can just specify a rounding amount and it will do the rounding for you there. So, implicit CSG eats a lot of CPU. And I mean a lot of CPU. It's marching squares on top of a pile of functions. And when you've got marching squares on top of that many functions, you can basically just eat the entire box you have and keep going. Um, additionally, with all the models that I showed you, I knew that they were centered on the object. But when you're working with, a, when you're working with just a raw equation, you don't really know where in space that is by default. So you have to keep a track of where your model should be and also what the formula of the model is so that you can make sure that you render the right space. If you render the wrong space, you end up with objects that are not even rendered at all or halfway out of the frame. So one thing that's important when you're rendering these spaces is you want to get your rendering window as close as possible to being tight against your object. So that's one thing that we've managed to make a lot of uh, progress with in ImplicitCAD the last uh, year or so is tightening up the window around our objects so that the only thing that is rendered is actually what we want instead of rendering empty space and just wasting our CPUs. There are a couple of 
of implications to the fact that we are using Haskell for this. We are generating and using functions in, inside of arguments, but when we do that in implicit CAD, we're kind of passing a function around that returns values, so we can't do something like show the function. Showing functions is verboten. So, it makes it difficult to print our intermediate dump. Uh, our risk comprehensions parallelize well, but yeah, there's not much, uh, there is not much overlap between 3D printer people and Haskell people, and when you add to that circle an overlap of people who are very strongly in favor of a strong copyright or strong uh, copyleft protections, that circle is about here. Um, additionally, I've, I've run into the issue where my users will constantly go, hey, this is abusing one CPU and I want this to go faster. But you've got to tell your users to, you know, plus RTS dash capital N dash QG to actually get it to use all the CPUs and use the parallel garbage collector. And I'm not sure if there's a good way out of that yet. I have not asked that many uh, other Haskellers. So if you know how to make my program parallelize by default, just come see me after the talk. So like I said, implicit CAD lets us use functions as arguments to many of these, uh, many of these open SCAD, other SCAD type functions. So this is a linear extrude of a set of five, a set of five circles. So we take, a, we take a circle, we take five of them, and we kind of lay them out in an X pattern. We round them, which is what the union R equals eight, so that it has kind of this rounded section between them. Let me see if I can actually, hey, does that? No, it doesn't. Ah, yes it does. So this rounding here, so that they're not actually five circles anymore. And additionally, we extrude that vertically, just like you know, you're extruding something out of a tube of toothpaste. But when it extrudes, we're applying that 35 times cosine h times 2 pi divided by 60, so that we get a nice wave function out of it as it goes up. It is actually changing its rotation as it as it goes in the positive direction. The twisting is not the only thing that we can do with a linear extrude function. So we can also vary its height. So you can kind of do a bump mappy sort of thing as you're extruding it in the positive direction. The, as I showed you a moment ago, twist. But what we have at least one problem here that with, uh, with scale, so if you're scaling and you're going in a positive direction, how do you make a box around what you're doing if you can't model the function that is actually being called here? So what we're doing right now and what we're trying to get our way around is we're sampling the function that you're scaling it by at like, I think it is seven different points so that we can get a rough idea of what the maximum bound of what you're scaling is. But since we don't have any way to model the function in this language, then we're not able to, uh, we're not able to really hard get that box in as close as we would like. So scale ends up giving us issues. Another thing we can do as we go up is we can also translate it in a direction. So, Kind of a real world problem here. So this is my 3D printer I dragged with me from the States. Don't ask me how shipping ended up working on that. Um, so I am reprinting my 3D printer one piece at a time. It's, uh, Lulzbot is the vendor and they are a very positive open source company, but at the end of the day, remember I was saying that an object when you get it in an STL form, it's kind of just triangles around the outside surface of the object. 
I don't consider that source code because it just lets you produce the object that you originally had. It doesn't let you change that to fit with the parameters of your machine. So I'm slowly reprinting this machine piece by piece. Part of the problem there though is that when you're producing a machine like this and some of the measurements are really hard to get, you end up with some strange stresses on the hardware. So for instance here, if you look at this spot here, that is a crack that is occurring in this part. And from a, uh, a problem that I had initially, see, this part is the successful one. There were a whole series of these pieces that just immediately snapped right off the surface. And the reason for this wasn't that the plastic was particularly defective or anything like that. I mean, the, the parameters here, I probably have the thickness of this part just a hair wrong, or there's a piece of the machine a little bit out of tune or out of spot. But this, oh wow, that totally just did not come out on this projector. Okay, well, this is a model, it is a cross section of a cathedral, and the important part here is that you see the coloration patterns. That is how force is distributed in this type of an object. So in this case, they're trying to protect against wind, literally just knocking the thing down. And so if you see, they're using curves all throughout this to distribute their force. By having a curve to distribute the force, it, well, it survives longer. These cathedrals have survived till now. And I essentially ended up doing that on my 3D printed pieces. So this here, this is that part that you were just looking at. And I put a curve between the point at which it grabs onto that bar and the flat surface that is the mounting point for this part. So that curve let that part survive long enough to crack naturally on the machine instead of just crack the moment that I take it off the printer. It was, yeah, I was not happy with that. I had to print like five of them in a row. And so one thing that I'm trying to do in the future, as I've, as I've been ranting here, functions really should be more modeled as a type in implicit CAD. We should keep them a little bit more a little bit more parsed so that I can predict what, what that scale object will do. And also we have a series of uh, users have been asking to write their own implicit functions and just run them through the engine. So we're hoping to expose that. So I mentioned that I'm the author of Ape Slice. Um, Ape Slice is a slicer for 3D printed objects. So it converts an object into a series of layers that you can actually print the thing. I'm trying to build a 100% 3D, 100% Haskell 3D printing stack. So I'm trying to work with more rotational motion printers because I'm building one. Source code is all up there. Please help. I know, Haskellers. <laughs> Um, OpenSCAD itself has been getting a little bit more functional. So in ImplicitCAD, I don't have to worry about adding functional programming to the language. I'm already in a functional language, so if I want to map an object against a, yeah, I can just do that. But in OpenSCAD, they're actually starting to get to the point where they can pass around functions, which is an interesting feature. It says in there nightly, but they do not have a release of it yet. So. I'm hoping they start getting into the functional programming world as well. And Associated Mind also built something they're calling Explicit CAD, which is an interesting, funny joke because they, yeah, let me explain the joke. I'm good at that. <laughs> so, so with Implicit CAD, of course, you can't see a thing because it's a compiler. With Explicit CAD, they're trying to put a graphic front end on it, the same way that a uh, same way that OpenSCAD's front end would work. So they built it, and it works, but yeah, they they've got other things to do too. So it kind of just sits there. Any questions?
it. <laughs> um, do the implicit CSG functions also need to get rendered with a marching cubes algorithm? Yes. There's no way around that or an improvement because you have like um, the, the functions yeah, that are not discrete. So. Yes, they're still running through marching cubes. Technically, it's a modified version of marching cubes, but it's marching cubes in the end. That, that said, the one that produces the 3D objects instead of the 2D objects is kind of working it from multiple angles at once and is not really marching cubes. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Like I said, I'm the maintainer of this program. I will be the developer of it whenever I can actually understand my way through that list comprehension. <laughs> Anybody else? What kind of arithmetic do you use to evaluate these functions? Is it just floating point? Or? Um, actually, there is a floating point. We're using double precision. But we also have a fork, which has been long-lived and unloved, which does this using rationals and just completely eats all the CPU, but we'll get you an answer. And back. And implicit functions? Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to make it where we can just drop the entire CSG part. As a matter of fact, when I use, when I use the engine inside of HSlice, basically to parse its own command line, I tell it, don't even bother having CSG functions so that I don't have to worry about somebody telling me the width of the printer is circle. you have an explicit representation of the functions that you can manipulate and not just ask for function, could you do something better than, than what you do today? Or is it uh, more about debuggability and fixability? If I could fix it, I would. <laughs> yes? So uh, you mentioned that the, the rational or arithmetic version is a fork. Mm -hmm. so is, there any, is it possible to pinpoint the reason why you can't just do that with a non-type class? Because I haven't used the non-type class. I am not actually a very good Haskell. Okay. <laughs> so it might be possible. It might be. But for now, I just made a uh, type class of a type class that works for either doubles or for mm -hmm. rationals, and then had to rewrite all of my functions with rational forms, square root, cubic root, all that wonderful jazz. Great, so time is up. Thanks again. Thank you.